Quantum Entangled, written by Fifty Shades of Octarine, narrated by She Makes Things. This is a multi-voice podfic. The part of Aziraphale is played by Fix and Fix. Our Crowley is played by Nosferatini. And finally, our Anathema is played by Ember. Chapter 1. Master debating all over Boar's grave. The ethics board didn't know what to do with him. Neither did the medical board, nor the astrological association. Dr. A.J. Crowley was an academic rock star, for all that the term rock star meant, in an environment where the ratio of knitted sweaters to human beings was an astounding 3.3 sweaters for every researcher in too many layers. His name was plastered somewhere on most of the papers produced by Tadfield University, as well as a hefty chunk of papers produced outside of Tadu. His groundbreaking statistical analysis popping up in all sorts of odd places, although most notably in Aziraphale's pub arguments. A born contrarian, the sciences had called to him. And of course they had. Science was the occupation of mule-headed pricks, see Nicholas Copernicus, curious entrepreneurial spirits, see Marie Curie, and madmen, see Freud. And Crowley just so happened to be all three. There wasn't a major field of study that he didn't have a thumb in. If there was a scientific consensus to be had on the matter, then there was also a Crowley to unrepentantly flip the bird at it. These were the foreboding thoughts overshadowing the mind of one young, although only young by the standards of post-PhD graduates, which is to say not young at all, Dr. Fell, as he glanced awestruck to the other side of the university cafeteria, where Dr. A.J. Crowley sat eating a bowl of store-bought salad. Aziraphale had been crushing, academically of course, on Crowley ever since he had read the man's first paper on multidimensional approaches to quantum entanglement. That Crowley was wrong in his conclusions about relativity and its subsequent angles of observation was no impediment to Aziraphale's appreciation of his intelligence. They might have disagreed on the finer points, but Crowley's writing was a wonder to behold. Aziraphale had nearly vibrated out of his seat upon spotting him. Never mind that he logically understood that Crowley published papers under Tad Yu, the same university that Aziraphale himself wrote for, and therefore bumping into him was not outside the realm of possibility. It was the principle of the matter. Aziraphale knew Crowley as a photo above a well-read author's note. It was something else entirely to witness him, breathing, flesh and blood as he gazed into his salad, wine-colored locks flowing down his back. Odd to know that he had poor posture, or that he forked his food around more than he actually ate it. Intimate, in a strange way. That Aziraphale could quote the innermost musings of a man mere meters away from him. Unfortunately, Aziraphale's single-player staring contest was quite suddenly put into co-op mode, as Crowley, almost like he could sense the attention goring into his back, looked up from his salad and into Aziraphale's now bashful gaze. A tense moment of delicate liminality followed, Aziraphale waiting, much like a man at the gallows, for Crowley's reaction to his impropriety. He was then surprised when Crowley's expression morphed into one of recognition, rather than one of disgust or awkwardness. Dr. Fell, Crowley called, a grin overtaking the once thoughtful lines of his face. He waved one of his arms haphazardly in a come over here kind of gesture, using the other to pull out a chair beside him. Aziraphale had the grace to be momentarily astonished before hurrying to meet his academic hero. Dr. Crowley, why, it's, it's a pleasure to make your acquaintance, I'll be honest. I, I never expected you to know who I was, let alone, well... He let his words trail off into pitiful nothings, stuttering and red in the face. Just Crowley, if you will. Or Anthony, if you must. And the pleasure's all mine. I first read your work... Oh. It'd have to be at least five or six years ago now. Your master's thesis, I believe, on Paul's doctrines. With a leering grin, Crowley leaned forward. I will admit, Dr. Fell, your writing had me positively hooked. He said it as though it were a secret, the kind you wouldn't dare repeat to your mother. 
However, from what Aziraphale could tell, he just sort of spoke like that. Like someone who was constantly sharing the intricacies of some deviant sexual act for all the innocence of the actual words themselves. Every sentence that fell out of his mouth reeked of an implied, you saucy minx, like the ghost of Fran Drescher past. Ugh, Aziraphale replied intelligently, taking a seat. Crowley seemed unperturbed by the sudden verbal ineptitude. When working with academics, you get used to an assorted array of oddball characters. It's terribly presumptuous and even more so unproductive to expect them all to conform to the standard back and forth of neurotypical communication. You don't get to become Dr. A.J. Crowley, pain in the ass to astrophysicists everywhere, by being over-particular about the oratory of one's downtime. You're wrong, of course. He continued with an impish grin, forking his salad cheekily. Aziraphale hadn't known someone could fork salad cheekily, but nonetheless, here Crowley was, attempting to prove him incorrect on two fronts. Wrong? Dear boy, that was my master's thesis. Should you choose to debate this, I fear I'll have the home field advantage. His response was deliberately unaffected, a haughty tune laced with the playfulness that Crowley was absolutely drenched in. Unfortunately for you, I've read it. And as such, I fear nothing. If at all possible, Crowley's smirk got even wider, eyeing up a challenge like a dog would eye a rather large T-bone steak. It made him seem like the kind of fellow you'd find jumping between skyscrapers in one of those panic attack inducing YouTube videos. Within the relatively safe environment of academic discourse, long past the days of Pythagoras' maths fueled murder, or for that matter, Plato's wrestling prime, it made his ear fail feel brave. Those are bold words, Crowley. Especially coming from someone who has genuinely used Trojinger's cat to argue for quantum superpositions. Startled, Crowley laughed, mouth opening wide enough to expose the mushy green remnants of the salad he had been chewing. Behind dark glasses, his eyes glittered with a delighted surprise that told Aziraphale Crowley hadn't read his paper on modern approaches to unified field theory. Just because the sod wouldn't have liked my stance doesn't mean I can't use his thought experiment to prove it. Anyway, the figures you'd like Schrodinger, all that religious symbolism. He sighed inching closer. It would have been a suave maneuver if not for the horrible screech of metal chair leg against hard concrete flooring. Aziraphale shuddered at the sound, wincing apologetically at Crowley, hoping to convey with his eyes alone that, oh no, I didn't notice your blunder, but I shan't make a fool of you. I'm kinder than that, see? Science as an imitation of the religious seems like more your sort of thing, actually. I prefer proper works of faith," he said instead, realizing that the eye message wasn't getting across all that well because Aziraphale was about as smooth as Crowley in that regard. Proper works of faith, huh? The rays of Crowley's eyebrows could be seen from space. Not that space would want to see such a thing. Aziraphale imagined that space would feel quite silly indeed if such a glance had been directed towards it. At least Aziraphale felt quite silly watching Crowley's eyebrows approach his hairline, knocking, not impolitely, for entry. C.S. Lewis mainly, and I don't mind a spot of Tolkien either. I don't suppose you read a lot of fantasy, do you? As Aziraphale was wont to do when embarrassed, he puffed up, and subsequently puffed down softening the sulky turn of his tone with the upwards lilt of a question at the end. I don't read much at all, really, although I do make an exception for the screw tape letters, answered Crowley, trying to find some common ground. You seem the type, devilish as you are in your academic work, Aziraphale teased. Regardless, Crowley soldiered on, giving tit for tat. Crowley liked tits. I'm more into the digital age, not that you'd know anything about that. You don't even have a Twitter as far as I'm aware. If Aziraphale had indeed known what Twitter was, it would have been remarkably telling that Crowley knew he didn't have one. A tweeter? Or X, whatever. I'm not above dead naming that twat's website. Crowley waved his arms about, like a man suddenly swarmed by a behemoth mass of particularly irritated houseflies. The movement made the all too lanky length of arm that stretched from his rotator cuff to his carpal bones apparent in its unwieldy gaucheness. So it's a website? Aziraphale inquired, honest in the innocence of his enlarged eyes. He was distracted, watching Crowley's impromptu interpretive dance, and thus wasn't schooling his face into what he liked to call professionalism. 
although it looked more like the expression one made when handed a toddler's colorful plastic toy, inexplicably supposed to resemble some antiquated notion of a telephone tasked with the arduous theatrical performance of Mr. Big Businessman on his big business conference call. Oh, Satan help me. You are a relic, came the breathless reply of Crowley, who was actually, for all his tight leather ensemble tried to say about his character, tried, being the operant word, giggling, full-on giggling. Good grief, I know how the internet works, Aziraphale pouted, hurt with a wound far closer to the truth than he was comfortable with it being. He wasn't anything like Newton, a friend by virtue of the fact that they were the only two people in the lecture hall, and maybe the entire university too, if he took a moment to introspect, which he didn't, using a typewriter to write out their tutorial notes. Newton, because he catastrophically and irreversibly pulverized any unfortunate instance of modern technology that found its way beneath his sweaty palms. Aziraphale because, well, he thought it was quaint. Uh, that argument is less effective when I can hear you capitalizing the I, you know. Crowley told him, still short on the breath, paid in the good humor of his last remarks. Aziraphale huffed. Fine, fine. How about this? I'll give you my number. You pop round my place, if you're available. Say. Crowley paused, if only to make himself sound less desperate in his own ears. This Thursday. And I'll show you the Lord of the Rings Extended Edition. He offered, lounging back further than his flimsy university chair should have allowed him. Maybe the chair liked him. Perhaps it was apologizing for the awful noise it had made scraping against the cement floor earlier. The reason didn't matter to Crowley's center of gravity, which, much like Crowley himself, was currently mouthing a curt fuck you to physics. I've read Lord of the Rings! Aziraphale gasped, affronted at the mere notion that he hadn't. Or, more accurately, that someone could look at him for more than five seconds and assume that he hadn't. Ah... But I'll bet my left bollock you've never watched it, Dr. Fell. And you really must. If you like Tolkien, it's around 20 hours of his original tale adapted into film. Although I doubt we'll get through it all. Crowley grinned. He was the grinning sort, Aziraphale decided. I'll bring the wine then. And just Aziraphale is fine. Do you have a preference? On the wine? Or your name? The question was drawn out like the weave of carpet threads under a disobedient cat's paw. It left Aziraphale in much the same state as the cat's owner, exasperated by the torn carpet and disappointed in the untouched scratching post that they had just ordered, shipped, and unboxed. The cat was probably, although unhelpfully, taking a nap in the empty cardboard shell that had once contained the scratching pillar. Well, both if you're set on being contrite. Aziraphale tutted, glaring at Crowley's metaphorically smug mug encased in his metaphorically Amazon Prime theme layer. For the wine, I prefer a Moscato, although I'll drink just about anything alcoholic if it's being offered. And for your name... Crowley paused, bouncing an idea around the empty tomb of his skull like a particularly self-flagellating game of Pong. I hope I'm not being too forward to suggest... well, I ought... Explain it first, oughtn't I? Crowley? It's just that I was reading your master's thesis and I couldn't help thinking. It's Satan. It sounds like it was written by an actual angel. And well, the name Angel kind of stuck. I was going to make a joke about it, but you didn't have the context and... Oh, I've just made an utter arse of myself, haven't I? Crowley? Give me your phone. Confused, embarrassed, and powerless to do much else, Crowley acquiesced. Taking the offered object, Aziraphale, with his tongue poked out in concentration and his chubby fingers fiddling with the settings, because, insult aside, Aziraphale was a relic, didn't spare a glance at the stone-still statue that Crowley was pretending to be. When the device was returned to Crowley's unmoved palm, it had been opened to a new contact entitled simply Angel. It left Crowley clueless, floundering for something useful to say. Aziraphale, for his part, was happy to watch him gape like a fish. I'll see you Thursday. Say, five o'clock? He demurred coyly, Pinky reaching out so that the cold metal of his ring met with the warmth radiating from the dorsal skin of Crowley's hand. Still without use of his tongue, the muscle could be an impenitent beast at the best of times, as Aziraphale knew, Crowley grunted an affirmative Mwah. sound. Wonderful. I'll see you then. Knowing how to quit when he was ahead was one of Aziraphale's finer skills, and so with that he left to go eat his lunch elsewhere. 
and also to Google what on earth this Twitter thing was. He was dissatisfied by Twitter, but not by his lunch. No lunch sated him quite well, as it often did, he reflected, looking over the swell of his stomach. It was just as he was taking his last bites that he received a text from an unknown number. Hey, it's Crowley. I just realized that we never actually got to why your master's thesis was wrong. XX. That's because it isn't, dear boy. A Z F. Oh, really? I disagree. XX. We can discuss such matters on Thursday, when I'm not running late for a meeting with my supervisor. I look forward to thoroughly eviscerating you. A Z F. Mm, I'll stock up on wine then. XX. I'll be counting on it. A Z F. <coughs> If you think I'm a worse debater while drunk, you're sorely mistaken. Don't think I'm blind to your devious tricks, Angel. XX. You wound me. I won't need alcohol to win a verbal sparring match with you. AZF. I'm a master debater, you know. XX. I'm sure you are. AZF. Oh, sugar, I really need to go. Have a wonderful evening, Crowley. If these are my last words, know that I've always loved Schrodinger. My supervisor might actually skin me alive when I get there. Goodness gracious. Lovely chatting with you regardless. A-Z-F. Gosh, he was late. Anathema, Aziraphale's formidable but quirky supervisor, was going to wring his neck like a repressed housewife in the 1960s, squeezing the last remnants of dirty dishwater out of a hand towel. Only, instead of soap bubbles, it would be Aziraphale's bloodied gut spilling out onto the linoleum floor. Anathema was a kind young lady, but there was an unmistakable fire in her eyes. It was the fire of a girl who had gotten her doctorate in her mid-twenties, and with nowhere else for her limitless passion, and it had to be limitless because writing a PhD at 40 wasn't an easy feat. Doing the same in half the time required about as much mental fortitude as one might expect, ergo limitless, to go, she had adopted Aziraphale as a kind of pet project. If you knew her, and you were gifted with any sense of self-preservation, no matter how small, you wouldn't willingly get between Anathema and her latest pet project. Aziraphale was currently getting in between Anathema and her latest pet project. Never mind that he was the pet project, he wouldn't put it past her to learn the lost art of necromancy in the wake of his recently corpsified body, post-murder on account of tardiness. A trivial little thing like death couldn't put a stop to Anathema device. Perish the thought, supposedly, on account of some author or another, there were only two constants in life, death and taxes. The first of these we've already discussed. The second, according to Aziraphale's blurry memories of the device estate and its subsequent callous disregard for bookkeeping, books of prophecy excluded, was no obstacle either. In the wake of such revelations, Aziraphale wished to propose an amendment to the popular idiom. There were only two constants in life, were being the preliminary condition, because, once Anathema device was born, death and taxes both tendered their resignations and held hands while they skipped gleefully into the sunset. Aziraphale hoped they had a holiday house, somewhere near the beach, where they could grow old together. He would do the same if he didn't fear Anathema finding his proverbial vacation in and thoroughly beating the proverbial or otherwise Anathema wasn't much fussed, ever loving crap out of him. The dark storm cloud of his anathema-themed violent musings had brought Aziraphale all the way to the faculty staff room. Its thin pine door was a wooden board lacking stature, opulence, and foreboding, but trying its best to make up for it by acting as the sole barrier between anathema device and the outside world. It was a futile effort as Aziraphale, easy as anything, pushed it open. The lock had broken an indeterminate number of months prior, and no one was bothered enough to do anything about it, entering the domain of his supervisor. Anna? I know I'm late, but uh, I'm here now, if that counts for anything. Aziraphale called, wafting the gift of crappy university coffee towards the hunched pile of sweaters sitting at Anathema's desk. The sweater pile turned to look at him, revealing circular spectacles that enlarged the eyes beneath them. Her elk fur-colored irises, blown out to proportions more fitting for an alien or an animated bug in a Disney classic, were not tempered by the human habit of blinking. Anathema had mastered the unmoved stare by the age of four. She was not going to let her streak, almost three decades unbroken, 
end now. Aziraphale, she said in a tone that implied that it could list your sins verbatim without need or want for breath. There was a moment of silence. Then, unlike herself, she sighed. <sighs> you don't even have a paper for me to demand a draft of yet. Neither of us have any work to do. For all intents and purposes, this is a social call. You can't be late to a social call, Azzy. It begins precisely when it does, with no interest in the time it was planned for. Anathema explained, making Aziraphale feel a mite foolish, as she was often wont to do. Having deposited the lukewarm beverage onto her workspace anyway, he made himself comfortable in the cubicle desk hybrid opposite her, where she was regarding the cup with the conditioned wariness of someone who had already known the taste of the grim sludge Tad Yu had taken to calling coffee these days. Her first sip wrestled a grimace onto her typically calm features, but by the time the second sip hit her tongue, she had acclimatized to the amalgamation before her. She continued drinking it, her exterior at least, affecting unperturbed. Anathema was always more for the content than the aesthetics. In this case, the content was caffeine, and the aesthetic was the offensive chemical concoction that contained said caffeine. I spoke with Crowley today, Aziraphale remarked, apropos of nothing. Hmm. Anathema hummed appropriately, if not disinterestedly, before actually processing what he had said. The thesis guy you were so excited about? The one with the dissertation on private social behaviors and their implications for modern notations of evolution? Anathema probed, suddenly interested in the conversation. The very same. Holy fuck, Azzy! You've had the biggest crush on- Academic crush? Her words were interrupted by the swift interjection of one, rather embarrassed, Az fell. He didn't need to say more on the matter. It was a well-trodden argument. I value his unique perspective. Fine, you've had the biggest academic crush. She coughed something that sounded an awful lot like... <coughs> Bullshit! <laughs> before continuing, Aziraphale offered her his handkerchief regardless. Politeness was something he prided himself on, even when his friends were being obstinate hecklers. On him for ages! This is big news! What did he say? Aziraphale floundered for a moment, unsure how to distill their brief meeting into something comprehensible. While most of Aziraphale's conversation strayed into the territory of a bit odd... His exchange with Crowley was more than a bit odd, even by his somewhat unusual standards. No, the banter between him and Crowley ventured past the ballpark of a bit odd, beyond the neighborhood of somewhat peculiar, and landed straight in the realm of weird nerds saying weird nerd things, capitals included. Not that Anathema wasn't a weird nerd herself, it was just that her particular brand of weird nerd veered more toward occult philosophy and historical chronology than it did toward quantum mechanics. He recognized me, actually. He mentioned my masters in passing, and he even asked for my number. Anathema knew all about Aziraphale's MDiv, having friended him doing a joint research project on the Salem Witch Trials. This meant that she also knew, more intimately than most, how utterly boring his thesis was. Well, boring to anyone who wasn't specifically that brand of weird nerd. It both surprised her and didn't surprise her that Crowley was exactly that brand of weird nerd. Surely, for as prolific and expansive a researcher as Dr. A.J. Crowley was, it wouldn't be beyond justification that his interest swept the dusty niche of Pauline Christian theology. But, on the other hand, it simply didn't fit the vague sense of academic identity he carved out for himself. His debonair leather jackets and faux suave saunter never seemed like a natural counterpart to the stuffy rigmarole of pastoral philosophy. Did he ask for your number, or did you bluster your way into his contacts? Her tone was suspicious, and not unwarranted. Aziraphale had, mostly by accident, ambushed himself into the texting roster of many a fellow bar patron, classmate, and, on one notable occasion, a critical care nurse. It was an unfortunate habit of his, coercing people into adding him as a new contact. Therefore, Anathema was not unfounded in her doubts. Finding himself unwilling to explain it, Aziraphale just handed her his phone. Letting Anathema draw her own conclusions was often the best option available when she scented a curiosity. Upon viewing, she grimaced. First at Crowley's comment about wanking on Boar's grave, and then at something she alone could parse. It was the kind of double-take that only she could do. One where the art of it was that she could present the aura of looking away without actually taking her eyes off the chat logs. He sends an awful lot of kisses, doesn't he? Was the sole comment she graced him with. I think that's just how he types. Aziraphale returned, for lack of a more poignant remark. Anathema nodded solemnly, like the text chain in front of her was instead a trial record straight out of Salem. It was oddly familiar. 
an absurd echo from their early postgrad. Angel? Anathema questioned the nickname. Something wicked about her. <laughs> I'm afraid that's an in-joke of a sort. Nothing as untoward as what you're implying, dear girl. <laughs> Aziraphale chuckled with the odd inflection of a bad liar, even though he wasn't technically lying. Sure. Anathema snorted, as unconvinced as a woman of her intelligence should have been when faced with such an awful performance. It was in the ensuing silence, an intentional silence on Anathema's part, she could break even the toughest of method actors with her intentional silences, that the telltale <laughs> of Aziraphale's phone brought news of an incoming text. Faster than Aziraphale by whatever metric he wished to measure them, other than perhaps the metric of who could devour a pie, eclair, or other sweet treat fastest, Anathema ducked under the desk to read what she hoped to be another message from Crowley. Lady Luck, as it appeared, was on her side, or was just as pissed with Aziraphale for no particular reason. Angel! She recited, with all the dramatic flair of a thousand William Shatners thrown into a Kugelblitz black hole. Did your supervisor? She paused for effect, and also to kick away Aziraphale's reaching hands as he tried desperately to get the phone back. Actually kill you! Squealing, her peals of laughter interrupted the very serious and not at all overacted sobs that racked her frame. With a slow breath, she steadied herself and retreated further into the cubicle half of the cubicle desk hybrid. I might just have to avenge your death. She read, voice gravelly, as she felt the script, or Aziraphale's private texts, depending on whom you asked, required it. If they've truly gone and skinned you alive. The message ended with two obscenely wet kissy sounds, no, paying homage to Crowley's typical sign-off. Then, prim and proper as anything, she got up from the floor under her desk and handed Aziraphale his phone back. She had the grace not to laugh outright, as he hastily scoured the message with greedy eyes of his own. Angel, did your supervisor actually kill you? I might have to avenge your death if they've truly gone and skinned you alive. XX. I'm dead. Gone. Deceased. Mourn my memory, Crowley. Wank over Boar's grave for me. A Z. <laughs> However shall I live without my poor dead friend Aziraphale? How can I go on without him knowing just how hard I could thrash him in a debate? Why am I left to suffer this meaningless existence without a Thursday night Lord of the Rings marathon? XX. I'm coming back from the Vale to inform you that, and I do want to be clear about this, it's on. The fact that you think you'd be the victor of our debate fills my vengeful spirit with enough outrage that I simply had to come back to life, if only to inform you of your own idiocy. AZF. <laughs>